Hi, and welcome to a video where we're going to find out what the buzz is really all about. My name is Christian Karatner, and today we're going to talk about all things 2BU phonemes, specifically fundamentals to help you and your students become better 2BU phoneme players for your band and orchestra programs. We're not going to talk about breathing today, which I want to mention right away at the beginning is probably the most fundamental aspect for 2BU phoneme players. It's so important that we as wind instrument musicians and instrument musicians that play the largest instrument in the band are really efficient and effective at breathing. So I encourage you to check out resources like the Breathing Gym or countless videos online for you and your students to improve your breathing efficiency and effectiveness to become better at your instrument and at your craft. So the purpose of this video today is really twofold. For you to improve and become a better model for your students. A lot of times, people that even teach in rural school districts, you might be the best to be euphonium player for miles and miles around. And I know that that might scare some of you, but... When I began playing the tuba euphonium, obviously the best way to learn is by listening. And I would encourage you to reach out to your students and send them Spotify playlists and different recordings of great tuba euphonium playing that you've heard or that you know of, because your students are really going to pick up quickly on that type of thing. But to be able to hear a live tuba euphonium player sound great and feel the resonance that that player can impart, you can't, you can't substitute that with an online recording. So I'd really encourage you to take these skills into your tool belt uh, and really think about becoming a better model for your students and not making excuses for, oh, I'm really a different kind of instrument player, but become a really great tuba euphonium player, even if it's a something as simple at the B-flat scale, uh, so that you can model a beautiful sound really effectively for your students and that they can learn to chase your sound. The second purpose of this video is to obviously equip you with more tools in your tool belt. Little tips and tricks that I've discovered along the way that are going to make you a more effective tuba euphonium educator. I would encourage you to pause the video and try some of these techniques throughout our time together today. I know that feels perhaps a little bit Mr. Rogers to pause the video and play around a little bit, but I'd also like you to try these things multiple times in a row because we often experience something once and maybe fail at it and say, well, that doesn't work. But I want you to try these things multiple times just like you'd want your students to do and see if you can get some improvement and maybe you've even got questions at the end and I'd be happy to answer them if you ever reached out to me. So I need you to grab two things to have a really great time with this video. So grab a mouthpiece and grab a straw. If you don't have a straw, a pencil will work. And further on, if you've got your instrument with you, we might also use a paper clip a little bit later. So let's grab our materials, have fun, let's get started. So to begin our journey on improving our sound as a tuba euphonium player, we're going to think about one simple math equation. Air plus buzz equals sound. Now you can put any superlative in front of any of those words that you want, and it's going to follow through on the equation. So great air and a great buzz equals a great sound. Bad air and a bad buzz is going to equal a bad sound. And it's really difficult to have bad air and a great buzz or a great air and a bad buzz. But either one of those is also going to produce a pretty negative uh, relationship with your sound. So I want you to encourage your students to buzz. We've already talked about the air and, and how important breathing is. But I really want you to think about melodious buzzing, especially for low brass players who rarely ever get to play the melody. Because if they think about buzzing their band music, they're going to be thinking about buzzing a lot of one and five. Um, and also so they're going to be buzzing in a really low register. And for me, when I was a beginner, even trying to play low B-flat was really difficult, let alone try to buzz it. It wasn't until I got to college as a music major where I could buzz into that lowest register uh, that I knew I could already play. So think about melodious buzzing in whatever register is going to be comfortable for your students. Think about melodies that you might hear on TV or in the movies or on the radio or uh, on, on Spotify playlists and that kind of thing. So it doesn't have to be restricted to just technique. Um, you know, the old school way of thinking about buzzing was buzz five minutes a day uh, or every time you practice buzz for five minutes. Well, what kind of buzzing? If it's only kind of that one five one thing, the students are not going to get hooked on that very quickly. Um, and so Melodious buzzing is going to get them to buzz along with their friends of other brass instruments, um, and they can kind of make music together right away. Um, you can also use it as a way to teach multicultural music right away by buzzing melodies from other countries and other cultures. Uh, so it's a really great way of incorporating something that is so essential into a tuba euphonium player's 
playing right away uh, by encouraging melodious buzzing. So when we think about teaching the initial buzz, I think there's two general ways uh, that I've seen it taught. One is perhaps a more old school way, and then I want to think about a new school way of teaching uh, a beginning buzz. So a lot of textbooks you'll read or things that you may have been taught might say, think about the word M and then think about buzzing from there. So a lot of times they'll even say, and push air outside of those lips. So when you think about M, mm, like that, the lips are together, mm, right? And then when we think about pushing air out, right? And we tend to get that really tight kind of sound um, that uh, you'll often see students like end up puffing their cheeks because they're thinking about keeping their lips closed. And your lips are not closed when you're playing a brass instrument. It's just fundamentally not, not true to have them closed. Um, when I use this mouthpiece visualizer, when I buzz you can see that there's an opening in my lips. That lip, that opening, that aperture, is where the vibration is happening, that sympathetic vibration from the air hitting the mouthpiece. So the lips have to be open. They can't be touching in order to buzz. And we think about the easiest analogy is to think about cymbals. And when you take two cymbals and you crash them together and keep them together, they make one quick sound, and then they don't make any sound. They don't ring. But when you crash cymbals and hold them apart, they ring, and that's when you get that traditional cymbal sound. So when we think about equating it to that other instrument, it, it makes total sense that that the lips must be open to vibrate and create resonance. So you can probably get away with teaching mm buzz uh, to most students. Um, but what I have found is that it, again, promotes the lips to stay closed and promotes a more closed overall embouchure, therefore a more closed overall sound. So I think that there's a slightly better way to be teaching it because what we want to think about are the fundamental concepts of an embouchure. So we think about anchoring the corners, and we think about keeping the center part of the lips supple or, or soft, like an, like that aperture. So that mm buzz might kind of teach us the lip roll, but some people might also push the lips out mm, like that. And we want to think about that, that part of that chapstick or lipstick part of our lips slightly rolling in when we buzz, okay? So when we think about anchoring the corners, <clears throat> we can also think about just touching here so that the students understand where the corners are. And then think about saying mm. Mm, and ask them, do you feel this firm up? I would avoid using the word tight because when we think about tight, we're going to purse our lips together like this. And again, what does that cause us to do? It causes us to lock the jaw. And, and that's not going to create that big open sound that we want when we actually plug it in to play the tuba. So what I'd actually like, to, uh, like us to think about is wrapping the lips around the air column. I know that that might be a different kind of concept for a lot of people, but Start from a place of open. So just have a student start by breathing in and breathing out. Okay. And then what you're going to try to do is kind of start to focalize or dilate, uh, reverse dilate that, that uh, center opening, that hole. And you're going to try to make it smaller. Where you want to get it smaller is this way first, not quite this, not as much this way because that aperture is more oval shaped, but you don't need to get into the specifics of that with your students. That's why I think the straw is super valuable. So if we grab a straw, um, and we think about, okay, now I want you to think about saying M with the straw in. Uh, right? So that's going to work really effectively because if they press too tightly, it's going to collapse the straw. And it's also going to probably hurt their lip a little bit, okay, to press. And it's even more pronounced if you're using a pencil. You're going to feel that pain right away. So just that soft lipstick part of the lips that doesn't have any muscle in it. It's just, just tissue. There's no muscle there. The muscle is all wrapped around in here in the embouchure. So this soft part here, okay, and then have students blow out. The other thing that I really like to straw for is because it teaches the, the natural downward airstream really well. So when we think about, us, this is more pronounced in trombone and trumpet, but it happens every now and then with tuba um, and euphonium. When we get an upstream player, they would end up playing and you'd see the straw right away. Okay, And they probably have a tough time keeping it still. It's probably going to shake quite a bit because that's not a natural thing for the lips to do. Okay, Naturally, the lips are going to want to do this. Now, when I'm blowing air out and I pull the straw out, my lips should close right away like that. And that teaches just the right amount of pressure. Again, come up with a better word than pressure for your students, but that teaches that right amount of just the lips are going to close, so there's enough firmness there that the vibration will happen. But if you're bending the straw, then it's going to be too much. 
Okay, so again, notice that what I'm doing is I'm taking a breath in and I'm closing my lips around the straw. So I'm wrapping my lips around that column of air. That also promotes that air is the number one thing, that air creates the sound, air creates the buzz. So we've got to think air first. When we think about mm, buzz, what we're taught to do is mm, buzz, form an embouchure, then push the air out. And that's not the way that the sound is going to be created. The sound starts with air, which creates the buzz. Okay, so a couple other embouchure things to think about. I don't think it's effective to teach the horse lips thing, right? Because that just doesn't happen when we play the instrument. And if, the, if anybody thinks that that's what's going on behind a tuba player's mouthpiece, they're really wrong. You can't do that and make a sound into the tuba, okay? It's a good relaxation technique if your lips get too tight or tired, but that's not really what we're going to be teaching our students to do, and it's not an effective embouchure. And then the next thing that I would really think about or stress is start on whatever note is going to be comfortable. Because a lot of students might be more inclined to play a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Start on whatever note comes out first. So after you've done some times with the straw, and we've, we've even blown air through the straw, then we're going to simply substitute the mouthpiece. And if the first time all that comes out is air, is okay, that's fine. I'd rather air come out than nothing come out at all. Okay, so we want to promote that good blend of air. So 50% air, 50% buzz or vibration. So if it's just air the first time, let's try wrapping our lips a little bit tighter around the straw. Ah, great. And, and notice we haven't talked about articulation at all. So we're going to get that little hua at the beginning of the sound, and that's totally acceptable for this point in our beginning journey. This is really going to promote that natural open embouchure that we want, and it's going to create that really rich, resonant sound on the tuba euphonium that we're looking for. So good luck. Try some of these things out, and let's move on to our next topic. So now that we've developed our buzz, we're going to plug it into the instrument and see if we can solve some of the other top issues with sound quality in the tuba euphonium world. So when I work with students from across the state and across the country, I see four problems that happen most commonly in terms of tone development. Number one, the jaw is just simply too tight or it's locked into place. Number two, the teeth are too closed. The teeth are almost touching or they are touching. Third, the tongue is too high. We're thinking too much of an E syllable. The arch of the tongue is too high, or the tongue is simply up at the top of the roof of the mouth. Um, and four, the lips are maybe too far forward, okay? Meaning that they are almost pushed right into the mouthpiece. So what that kind of sounds like when I do all of those things in coordination is this. Uh... Now, you hear that that still produces a sound, it still produces a buzz, but what you really don't hear is that blend like we talked about earlier of 50% buzz, 50% air. So we start to get a sound that sounds like this on the tuba. Now, chances are you've heard that sound at some point in your career in your band or orchestra room at one point or another. So what we really need to stress is that the lips move independently from the teeth. And that's really going to solve a lot of the issues right away. So if we think about asking students to open their jaw, oh, and think about their teeth being separate, keep the teeth separate and see if you can touch your lips together. Oh, you can make sort of jokes like we, you know, some sort of humming or, or monk kind of thing going on. Um, and that's really going to be the, the sound that we're looking for because we're, it promotes that open jaw. It promotes that resonant spot inside our oral cavity, which creates a much more beautiful and resonant sound. So other things that we can try to do that seem elementary, but they really work. We want to think about opening the molars, opening our teeth, and then the fronts. So think about having the lips together. Think about them buzzing and see if they, you can get them to actually open their teeth and separate as they're playing. So that sounds a little bit like this. And on the mouthpiece, you can hear that air really start to open up and that sound open up. Let me do it again. 
So I start by opening these back teeth first. Really, your teeth are opening at the same time, but the student doesn't necessarily need to know that. And then adding the front teeth into that gets them to open up even more, and then you get that much more open sound. And it sounds like this on the tuba. Another thing that will really help is to think about lowering the tongue. And I choose to use that language instead of dropping the jaw. Because I think if we drop the jaw, if we think about consciously dropping the jaw, we're going to think about forcing a structure again. And that's going to, again, end up locking the jaw in a way that we don't really want it to happen that way. So when we think about lowering the tongue, that creates enough of that oral space. Uh, a teacher once told me, think about a tongue, or excuse me, an egg being tall on your tongue and don't break that egg. So when we think about lowering the tongue instead of lo locking or lowering the jaw, that's going to be a lot more effective. Uh, the other thing that you could try to do is think about pulling down the chin. So thinking about a little string on the bottom of your chin and trying to pull that down. So like this. Okay. Now the problem is, is that can again force a structure. So we want to make sure that they're still able to effectively form the embouchure. What this does do a good job, however, is promoting the corners being slightly pulled down, which is going to create that better natural embouchure, um, which we should have fixed with the straw trick from earlier in this video. But having those corners down promotes the top lip uh, being above the bottom lip and thinking about a slightly downward airstream. So the last thing that we would think about is that when the buzz is too tight, we're probably pushing those lips too far into the mouthpiece or maybe trying to buzz with the entire set of your lips as opposed to thinking about that buzz actually only happening in that center aperture. So sometimes that will sound like this. Right? And, and what they're trying to do is buzz with their entire lips, both top and bottom, all the way across. Um, so what we really need to think about is just that hole in the center. So again, a mouthpiece visualizer is a great tool for that um, because then they can actually see themselves uh, doing that right in the center and not trying to do that on the sides. But if we think about trying to roll those lips just ever so slightly and think about just buzzing in the center as opposed to from the sides, we're going to get a much more open sound. So pulling those lips out of the mouthpiece as opposed to pushing them in. So here's what that sounds like. Right? As I slowly go from in to out. You'll also notice that the pitch will drop because there's less tension, there's less tightness. And here's what that sounds like on the tuba. Now here's one fun little tip that might actually help improve the sound quality of your tuba euphonium players quite a bit. We've all heard of these things called burps, and they're a black plastic thing that you can kind of attach to the lead pipe. Um, and what that does is get the student to kind of hold the instrument um, and still be able to buzz because the, the lead pipe is just kind of off center so slightly. Um, but you may not be able to afford burps for your entire band program. So this is kind of the, the poor man's burp, is to put a paper clip into the lead pipe of the tuba. Obviously you want to attach it on the side so you don't just throw it into the lead pipe. Um, and then try to put the mouthpiece in. Uh, you don't want to jam it in there so it gets stuck. Uh, but what you're going to find is that's a really great way of promoting a really rich, healthy buzz where you get some of the resistance of the tuba to actually help you um, develop that sound. Because some students may not be predisposed to buzzing uh, really, really well at the very beginning of their playing. Um, but this is a great way to get some of that resistance to come back. It gets them a little bit closer to the pitch. They can finger along. They could play some of their music, but it's basically buzzing through their music. Um, and it's a really great practice technique that's really going to help develop the sound. And here's what it sounds like on the tuba.
So as with anything, this is going to maybe be some trial and error for you and your students. Uh, so I have found that the most effective of those things is to separate the teeth. Um, sometimes I'll tell students that pretend that you're chewing gum or pretend that you've got peanut butter stuck in your teeth and you're trying to separate your jaw. Um, and that really helps to do a lot of a lot of things. To separate those teeth is going to lower the jaw, which is what you ultimately want to do without having to force a structure. Um, it's going to cause the lips to roll in so slightly because you can't keep the lips pursed out. And, and, and drop that. Lowering the tongue really, really helps. So again, you can have them just say like, say e, say a, sa, say a, say o. And you can even see the tongue dropping in, in my face as that happens. So when we think about dropping to the bottom of the floor uh, of our mouth, separating the teeth, and sometimes what we'll find is you may have to go back to that other sound when I modeled on the tuba where they start closed and then they open up. And like my, my, my old teacher used to tell me, catch students doing something right. And when you see them doing it right or you hear them doing it right, ah, get them to turn on that light bulb. That was it. Did you hear that? That was fantastic. So oftentimes, these are great lessons to record as well. So, you know, secretly record it on your phone if you need to. But I like, say, I'm going to record this for you, and I want you to hear the difference. Because on that side of the tuba, they may not hear the difference as pronounced as you do. So by sharing a recording with them that you took, uh, of them actually going from closed sound to open sound, it's going to be so obvious for them to see that, and so obvious for them to encourage that kind of development. And they're going to get hooked on improving. And and then all of a sudden, your tuba euphonium section is going to have this beautiful foundation for your band. So let's continue on our journey and let's think about how do we improve the range of tuba euphonium players. When we think about developing the range of a young tuba euphonium player, we want to think obviously in a low octave and a high octave. So the first principle that I'd encourage you to think about is just get the sound to come out. So especially with the low octave playing. Low octave playing is something that's often very infrequently uh, explored for tuba players as long as they can get the low B flat and maybe down to the low F and sometimes the tuba players even start to run out of valves. But getting them into that lowest register is really going to have so many benefits for all of their playing including their upper register playing. So just getting the sound to come out is going to be a huge first step. And what you might discover is that sound that comes out is more of that closed sound where the lips are a little bit closer together. And here's why. The lips are closer together to keep the vibration happening. Okay, Because young tuba players are not used to using enough air to play the tuba. So in that lowest register, if we finally get them using more air, then they can open up their lips more and create a better sound. So the low register promotes better air use and is going to open up their lips even more. So it's always a balance as a brass player in terms of the tightness of the lips and the amount of air that's going past them. So the tighter the lips are, the less air that's going to maybe go past it, or it's going to be faster because of that, and you're going to play higher. So in the lowest register, it's got to be this cautious balance of really open lips as the abisher being very open, aperture being very open, and a really large air column that produces that sound. So then, therefore, you want to work from something that is comfortable uh, and work towards the uncomfortable. So starting on low B flat, maybe doing a Remington series down um, and getting the student to have that great modeled sound that we really worked hard on and gradually work into that lowest register. And eventually their lips might have to close um, a little bit to get the sound to come out, and that's great. So set a goal, maybe by the next week we get one half step that sounds a little bit better. And if you do that, I mean over 14 weeks, you're going to have another octave on your range easily. Um, so that, that doesn't take that much time if you are diligent about the way that you're practicing it. Okay. The other benefit is that you can have your students practice reading things down an octave. And for a tuba player especially, that is a hugely important skill for their development. And here's why. If you can get them to read down an octave and not have to worry about figuring out what that octave transposition is and having to fumble through the fingerings, now you've opened up a huge amount of repertoire for them. All the trombone stuff, all the euphonium stuff, now they can play along, no problem. They can play in their own octave, but they can read along and play in octaves with euphonium and trombone players uh, in your band program. When the orchestra director might come to you and say, hey, can you have somebody play string bass um, in orchestra and say, well, I don't have a string bass player, but I've got a tuba player. And you hand them the music and the music's going to be way up in the top of the bass clef. That, well, it's supposed to be sounding an octave below. So the tuba player is now going to be able to do what is supposed to sound uh, on that string bass part. You can also plug that into any sort of jazz band if they're going to read a string bass part that's written out. Or maybe you need a fourth trombone part uh, that you need a tuba player to cover. Uh, I did that 
that quite frequently in my high school jazz band. Um, and when the notes would get too high, I'd simply flip them to a lower octave. But it's because I had all of this practice reading things down an octave that it became just like a second language to me. And it's not that difficult of a skill, but you do have to force your students into doing it uh, every now and then. But that lower octave playing is going to increase the amount of air that you're going to use to play the tuba, and that's going to have huge benefits for the quality of sound and the resonance. So that low range development is so important for tuba playing. When we think about the upper octave, the two things that we really need to think about for low brass playing uh, when we're working on our upper register development is blow down and faster air. So when we think about blowing down, we're thinking about actually blowing the airstream in a downward fashion. And this is where that straw can really come in handy again. So if we put the straw and form the embouchure like we've been taught to wrap the lips around the air column like this, Right? So now we're going to let go of the straw and try to get the lips to move the straw and, and kind of move the straw down without pinching the straw. So watch. Now, you can't see that the straw went down from this, this view, but you can see that the bottom lip started to roll underneath the top lip, kind of like tectonic plates, one subducting under the other one. And that's the exact concept that we want to think about, that bottom lip rolling in and that top lip rolling on top. What that's going to do is create faster air for us, which is the second concept, because the air's got to move faster across the arch of the tongue and across that lip shape. Okay, By blowing that airstream down, it's going to spin the air faster, and it's going to make it easier to play in that upper register. It also prevents what normally happens when students play in the upper register is they bring the lips closer together and they start to close the lips to get that upper register stuff to come out. And that's not going to promote, they're going to eventually top out. It's not going to promote a good healthy sound in that upper register. So keeping the good principles of an embouchure, you just do a reverse Remington and go chromatically up from a good sound. And now let's go up a half step. And as we go, we're going to be thinking about blowing the airstream more down, rolling that bottom lip underneath and thinking about faster air that's going to make, and faster air does not mean more air all the time. It's going to feel maybe like more to them, but what you want to increase encourage them with the language that you use is that you're going to feel the wind move past your lips faster. Okay. And so that's not going to confuse them about blowing harder. Okay. Which blowing harder is going to promote a more stiff and, and, and forced structure to the embouchure. And it needs to still be open to vibrate because the second we press those lips together, the vibration stops um, and then the sound stops. So these are really helpful principles for developing range, both in the lower octave and in the upper octave. And I cannot stress enough that your upper octave range is going to become so much better by working on the lower octave. And because these range things are something that we don't often succeed at right away, we tend to not practice them as much. We don't like to practice what we're not good at. So realize that you can only practice so much of that upper octave before your face might get a little bit tired. So by balancing your practice and thinking about, okay, we've done some upper octave work, now let's balance that with some lower octave work. It can simply be taking an etude book and reading it down an octave. And again, that's going to be terrific for developing the range of your tuba players and your euphonium players alike. So now let's talk about some of the materials that I think are going to be really beneficial for your young tuba euphonium players, both in the etude realm and in the solo realm for their overall sound, tone, range development. So chances are your band program might use something like Essential Elements or Entered of Excellence, one of those band method books for your younger players. And that's terrific, but I think most of us have learned that it doesn't really cover everything, and we might need to find some supplemental materials for our tuba euphonium players, especially to get them to play more melody which is so important for the just overall musicianship that you want to develop in these young players. So the first place that I'd actually look is a very, very old method book uh, written by Walter Beeler, B-E-E-L-E-R, Walter Beeler. Um, there's uh, book one and a book two. It's very, uh, very dry. Um, there's just a lot of content in these books. They're much thicker than the average lesson book, and there's just a ton of black and white notes. There's a ton of rhythms to play. There's not a lot of fluff. There's not. There's zero color. Uh, there's zero diagrams, um, but there's good pedagogical information at the beginning of the book um, that is mostly current, some dated, um, but used in conjunction with th something like Standard of Excellence or Accent Achievement or, or Essential Elements, any of those things. 
is going to be a fantastic way to start. And you could start maybe midway through volume one. Once it gets past teaching all the notes and teaching fundamentals like uh, time signatures and accidentals and that kind of stuff, it just has content and content and content. And then you can speed into volume two really quickly. Uh, and because they're so old, they're cheap um, and, they're, and they're relatively easy to find. Um, but after that, you'd maybe want to use a tuba specific. And by the way, the Beeler book comes in uh, both euphonium trombone version and in tuba. Um, and, and some of these books will also work for euphonium as well, but these are going to be slightly tuba focused for just a second. Um, we all know the Blazevich book for tuba players. The Blazevich book is the standard, and that's where all the all-state etudes come from. Um, it's the selected studies book for euphonium, and those books can get very difficult very quickly. Um, and there's some etudes that are easy and some etudes that are a little bit more difficult. So I would recommend for melodious playing is the Bordoni book, uh, Bel Canto Studies, uh, or the Rochu book, um, Melodious Etudes. Um, and the Rochu version is usually for trombone euphonium, and the Bordoni version is usually for tuba. Most of that works well together. The key signatures are mostly the same. They do change a little bit in the Bordoni book, and the order's a little bit different. But I would even encourage your tuba players to get the Rochu book, because now you can play in, in octaves um, with your trombone euphonium students, uh, and they get the practice of reading down an octave, or even reading down two octaves, which is really good for their development. Um, and so if it's a Bordoni book, I'd encourage them to read down an octave. Uh, euphonium players, read down one octave in the Rochu book uh, in terms of that range development we talked about earlier. But this is melodious playing. You can get students to buzz. You can get students to wind horn, just blowing kind of what's called air and fingers uh, through that. Uh, is hugely important for their melodic development of their musicianship, their sense of phrasing. And I find that the Blazevich and Selected Studies books are more challenging in terms of elementary teaching of phrasing and fundamentals. Um, I think it's more of like reading by rote and learning by rote um, and having to cram a bunch of notes to get those things in. So I would really recommend slowing it down. Um, these beautiful etudes are really great for teaching melody and legato playing. Uh, another book that's very similar for tuba is called, um, it's the Shoemaker uh, Legato Etudes. Um, it's a really fantastic book and it's not very difficult. Um, and so it teaches, uh, a, again, good melodious playing. Um, for tuba specifically, uh, an additional Low Range book is by Phil Snedeker, who's actually a trumpet player, wrote a book called Low Etudes for Tuba. Um, and it's very difficult, very challenging, and I would not recommend that book um, until you know, later years in high school um, or for very developed young players. Um, and you probably need at least a four valve tuba to make that happen. Um, but that's a really fantastic book for low octave melody. Um, and then books that uh, are, are, you know, work for both trombone, euphonium, and tuba, we think about the Arben book and the Tyrell book. Um, and those books are great for teaching just technique. The Tyrell book is a, a very formulaic book um, where it's going to maybe start in one key signature, go to the relative key signature, transition through some accidentals, and then come back. Um, so it's a very formulaic book. Um, so it's very simple to understand. Um, and it's a ton of notes. Again, very dry. There's zero pedagogical information in the Tyrell book. And there's tons in the Arben book. The Arben book just gets a little bit pricey. Um, so the Tyrell book is a really great way to go as well. So when we think about solos, I'm going to think about some very good beginning tuba solos here for you. So let's think about Thrice Happy the Monarch uh, is a really great easy solo for high school students to learn. Um, and then they might graduate to something like Aaron Bure, um, another solo called Largo and Presto. Um, and then finally, when they get a little bit more proficient, you want to challenge them a little bit more. Something like a piece like Emmett's Lullaby, which has even got some cadenza-like passages in it, or the Concertino for Tuba and Band by Frank Ben Crescuto. And then when they get even more advanced, you want to think about Andante and Rondo by Capuzzi, which is actually a string bass solo rearranged for, uh, for tuba. And that's a great one that euphonium players can play too. It's written out for trombone, euphonium, and bassoon too. So those are some really great solos that are going to help with the development uh, for, your, for your young tuba players. And here's a quick hit list of some euphonium solos as well. As far as euphonium-specific solos go, we actually would start with some crossovers with the tuba. So we think about the Haddad suite for tuba, which is great for tuba players, and he also has a suite for baritone, which is a great solo for euphonium players. We'd also maybe think about the Marcello sonatas. There's E minor and there's an F major one. Uh, really, any key of the Marcello sonatas, they're arranged for tuba and euphonium, and they're really great multi-movement works that are great for teaching all of the developmental skills that we've talked about today.
Okay, so when we dive into euphonium specific things, a lot of these also will cross over with trombone. So we think about the row parts on Dante and Allegro. We think about the Barat introduction and dance. Um, there's a really beautiful serenade by Franz Schubert, obviously arranged. Um, Rhapsody for euphonium by, by Jim Kernow. Uh, beautiful Colorado, kind of one of those old theme and variation-esque kind of pieces. And then when they get more proficient, start ripping off some of the trombone literature like the David uh, Concerto and things like more so symphonique. Um, and these are all going to offer opportunities for lyrical and technical playing that's going to challenge them, that's going to help them develop, and is going to be able to use a lot of these fundamental skills that we've worked on um, and not overly tax them where they're just thinking about learning the notes to pass the solo exam, but they're also able to apply the fundamental fundamentals, which is really so important when we think about choosing literature for these young and developing players. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to watch this video today to improve both your skills as a tuba and euphonium player and most importantly as a tuba and euphonium teacher. I've tried to outline lots of simple fundamentals, tips and tricks that I've discovered along the way, but if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to work with you or your students so that they can improve as a tuba euphonium player and have fun making music, which is what it's really all about. It's fun to be great at something and it's fun to make beautiful music and to create a beautiful sound on this instrument that is not often known for a beautiful sound, at least the tuba is not always. To create that kind of beautiful sound is so important for their self-development, their self-sense of pride, um, that they don't have to be looked upon as less than, or I don't ever get the melody, but there's opportunities for these students to really flourish and develop um, and to be great musicians that have a lifetime of making beautiful music ahead of them. So thank you so much for watching this video, and best of luck in your tuba euphonium journeys in the future.